Public affairs programming on WQPT is brought to you by The Singh Group at Merrill Lynch. Serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years. Preparing for the sun to disappear and making sure we're doing everything to keep this earth healthy. Both issues tonight on The Cities. Mark Schwiebert is best known for his tenure as Rock Island Mayor and for the Riverside Park that bears his name. Now he wants to make a difference in how we look at the environment and how we deal with climate change. That's just ahead. But first, blotting out the sun. On Monday at high noon, we'll see something almost surreal. By that time, the midday sun is at its peak and we'll already be in the early stages of a total eclipse. It's something many of us have heard about but have never seen. Is it hype, hysteria, or is it really something amazing? Well, joining us is Augustana College Professor of Physics and Astronomy and Director of the John Deere Planetarium, Dr. Lee Karkner. Dr. Karkner, good of you to be here. Oh, thanks. It's great to be here. I know exactly where you're going to be on Monday. You couldn't be anywhere but Southern Illinois, right? That's right. Uh, Southern Illinois will be uh, close to the midpoint of totality where we'll get the most total eclipse of the sun. Up here in the Quad Cities, we'll get about 93%, which will still be pretty impressive. And the peak is 114 in the afternoon? That's right. At 114, the sun will be the most covered that it will get for here. But this is not something like, oh, you walk out the door at 114 and there it is. No, no, this is gradual and it builds up starting at what, about 11, or 1130, 1145? Yeah, a little bit before noon, uh, the moon will pass in front of the sun and it will start very slowly to get gradually darker and darker. Uh, until until a little bit after one o'clock when we'll get our maximum darkness and then it'll take about another hour and a half for the moon to go out again. So there's about three hours of worth of the eclipse happening, yes. And why, one big question is why is this so unusual? Why doesn't this happen all the time? Well, it's a strange thing about the sun and the moon. The sun and the moon in the sky, we don't usually notice this, they're almost exactly the same size. So only when they're lined up perfectly does the moon eclipse the sun. And that shadow of the moon is pretty small. It's only about 100 miles wide. So sometimes it's over an ocean or sometimes it's over mm -hmm. Antarctica. To have that shadow go right through the middle of a country like the United States is pretty unusual. So lots of people will get a chance to see this one. Well, let's be honest. This is something that you very seldom, if ever, see. And, and historically, I mean prehistorically, this had to be frightening for humans on Earth. There's lots of records we have of eclipses being important events where people being being amazed. The sun disappears for a couple of minutes and then comes back again. So this has always been thought of as being a really significant, important thing. Of course, nowadays we can predict them very precisely, so we're not going to be surprised by it. We can plan ahead a little bit and get a good view of it. Yeah, you scientists have kind of destroyed it all for us. I mean, you, you've got it down to the very minute. You know exactly when it's going to happen. Yeah, we're just doing our job. That's right. <laughs> what is the impact then? Because, I mean, they come, they go, they happen. Is it any long-lasting impact on Earth? Uh, the, the totality is only a couple minutes, so the sun only totally goes away for a few minutes. Uh, so it doesn't really have much impact on, on the Earth. Eclipses happen all the time. It's really more for us. It's really more of something to go out and watch. It's more of a spectator sport in some sense in a scientific event. It's something that you can really get an amazing experience to have the sun disappear, or almost disappear, in the that, middle of the day. That's what I was curious about. I mean, is it really a scientific event anymore? I mean, what can you learn from this eclipse? Uh, there have been science that's been done with eclipses. In fact, that's one of the ways that Einstein's theory of general relativity was proven in 1919. Um, but nowadays, the science of the eclipse really takes a backseat to the spectacle of the eclipse. It's really more for something for us to enjoy than something where we really learn cutting edge science about. Now, like we said, you're going to be in the Carbondale area on Monday which is the area where it's, what, 100%? I mean, it's absolute, it's the best location? That's correct. There's a stripe right across the middle of our country where we will have a total eclipse, where the sun will totally be blocked out. Uh, and the point where the eclipse will last longest is right in the middle of southern Illinois. Uh, so uh, faculty and students from Augustana College are taking a little field trip down there to help out with Southern Illinois University's event in Carbondale. What are you expecting? I mean, this is, uh, this is a, a, an event that people, and not just nerds, Exactly. <laughs> it's good for normal people too. No, normal people will also enjoy this, but it's going to be what ten times the population that Southern Illinois usually yeah, has. Yeah, it, it should be a it should be a crazy event like a Woodstock and, <laughs> and a science fair rolled into one. Yeah. But um, if you've ever experienced time inside of eclipse, it's it's kind of a cool thing. You definitely notice something is strange and different even before totality happens. The quality of light is different, and so it's it's an interesting thing to really experience personally. I got to tell you because we were talking a little earlier is that I experienced some type of solar eclipse in the early 
90s when I was in Western Michigan, mm -hmm. and and you know we all don't look at it. We were looking at the ground. We were seeing the little uh, uh, the uh, the little hole. And you could see it uh, uh, happening as a reflection on the ground, but it just seemed to get uh, darker, and it seemed to be a little more surreal. It seemed like the wind died down and you started hearing birds more. I mean, it just seems to have some kind of, the only word I could think of is surreal impact on you because this isn't supposed to be happening in the middle of the day. Right, it changes the quality of light. You'll notice that the shadows seem a little bit different. Uh, nocturnal animals will start to become active. They'll be tricked into thinking that nighttime is happening. Um, and so there's lots of little subtle things about the eclipse that are kind of interesting to observe. The sort of the atmosphere feels like it, it changes um, as you sort of pick these up subconsciously. But as you said, 114 is about when it reaches its peak. Well, then when does it start to wane? When do, when do we start getting our sun back? After that, that, then things get brighter again. Yeah, we want the sun to come back. And after about an hour and a half, then the eclipse, uh, the eclipse is about three hours long, uh, an hour and a half to get to the closest to maximum darkness. And then about an hour and a half, uh, everything will get brighter again. It will all happen in reverse. And then we'll be back to our normal three o'clock in the afternoon sun. <laughs> Any impact like with tides? Because I mean, the moon has such an impact on tides, but the moon would be there anyhow. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't have any impact, would it? Uh, yeah, the, the moon doesn't have any special impact uh, geophysically. Uh, there's not really a lot of effect on the eclipse. I think really the effect of the eclipse is on people who experience the mm -hmm. event. But they're also a little worried about technology as well because of solar energy, because of perhaps cell phone use. Uh, um, I mean, is there going to be, because our, our world has become more technical than it was in 1979, that there could be something? Or is this like the year 2000, we all got worried? Um, well, we, we want to make sure that we're careful about uh, some sure. things, but um, the, um, the eclipse doesn't affect uh, power or energy or generation or anything like that. Uh, I believe where the effect will come in is that everyone in the country will try to take a selfie of themselves with the eclipse and upload it onto social media at the same time. So you may see Twitter and Facebook go out from the massive overload, but that's really more of a human thing, I think, than a, than a cosmic thing. Well, and actually they were saying that in your area where you're going to be in southern Illinois, cell phone service could be really disrupted. It could impact 911 and emergency services because everyone's going to be on their phone at some point during that period of time. That's right, yeah. So there will be a human impact when you have that many people doing something at the same time. So yeah, that's true. We want people to be careful of there. So the key is I've got this. Right. And the thing is, I did look, and, and we'll show a close-up of this, is that the uh, you need that ISO label that's on here. Tell me about these glasses sure. and why these are so important. Yeah, so we want to make sure that safety is something that we emphasize. So I want to make two points. Number one, this is very important. Do not use a telescope or binoculars or any optical device. That, that's how you go blind. So, I mean, that's not just a wives' tale. That is absolutely true. If you've ever taken a magnifying glass and burned a hole in something, that's what will, ha what will happen to your eyeballs if you use a telescope or binocular. So please put those away unless you're a professional astronomer and know what you're doing. Uh, what you want is, is something like this. Uh, these are very simple uh, mylar glasses, and uh, they just have a, 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 a film in front of them that blocks out 99.9% .9 of the light. You put something like this on your face, you can't see anything, but when you look at the sun, it'll dim it out enough uh, to view safely. Uh, so make sure you do have the right kind of these. Put them on and take a look at the sun, and if it mm. really hurts your eyes, you maybe have a bad one and don't, don't use that one. It should be comfortable viewing. Um, but as long as you stay away from telescopes and binoculars, and you have a good filter on your eyes, you can watch the little disc of the moon go right across the sun. It's a cool thing to look at. Well, and this is a great thing for, you know, to teach your kids and all that, but tell me about the other options that you have. I mean, what about that, that cutting a hole in a, in a piece of uh, 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 wood or, 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 or cardboard or something like that? I mean, how does that work? Sure. Um, I usually think that these are the most convenient, a pair of Eclipse glasses. Um, if you don't have that, don't despair. Just take a piece of cardboard, poke a hole in it with a pin, and you can make what's called a pinhole camera. Project the sun, let the sun shine through the hole on a piece of paper and you'll see a little image of the sun uh, with the moon covering it uh, so you can see it indirectly so that's another safe way and very inexpensive way you just need a pin and a piece of cardboard and you can watch it that way and it sounds anticlimactic but it really is cool to see that's it right. that way I mean because you are seeing the projection and you are seeing something right. uh, that uh, that you're doing it safely you can watch the uh, pro progress of the eclipse that way yes with with no with no expenditure required yes what's nice also is that I know that you're not going to be around but there's gonna be a lot of people that are gonna be collecting I know the Putnam Museum has yes. some things. The Moline Public Museum has a, 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 a the Moline Public Library has has a few events. I mean, that's kind of neat too. If you if you've got kids or family members, because you can learn a little bit more about what you're seeing. I mean, you would really recommend people to go to some of these events. That's right. So the local astronomy clubs, local astronomy enthusiasts are going to be setting those up at Putnam, uh, at the Moline Library. Uh, they're going to have properly filtered telescopes mm -hmm. uh, because those guys know what they're doing. Uh, so those would be great events to go to. You can learn more about the eclipse. There's people there that that will be happy to share their 
knowledge with them. So that's a cool event to go to. Okay, I've got statistics and dates I'm gonna throw at you. Since okay. 1503, there have been 15 total solar eclipse paths that have crossed the path of the August 2017 eclipse. So that shows you how rare it is. 15 times in more than 500 years. Also, the next annual, annular, I should say, solar eclipse in the U.S. will be on October 14th, 2023, but that'll be visible in the Southwest, Northern California on through Florida. What is an annular solar eclipse and how is that one different? Right, so what we're talking about here, if you are in the path of totality, is that you'll see the sun completely covered. An annular eclipse is an interesting thing because the moon's distance from the Earth isn't constant. When the moon's a little further away, it can't quite cover the sun. Oh, okay. And so instead of totality, you'll have a ring of light around the outside. Which That's is still pretty eclipse. cool. It is kind of a cool <laughs> thing, but it won't get totally dark. And so in, in 2023, that'll be visible uh, through the southwest. We'll get a, a partial eclipse here. Um, but even more exciting, in 2024, there'll be another total eclipse. April 8th, 2024, visible from Maine to Texas. That will go across the country as well, right through the middle of the country. Similar to this one, but a slightly tilted path. But in both cases, you'll have a path of totality that goes through southern Illinois. So southern Illinois is well positioned for both eclipses. So if you, you don't quite get a good view of the 2017 one, there's one coming up in 2024. So how can you beat that? Well, but that's what makes it sound so quirky is that it didn't happen since 1979. Now it's happening in 2017, and then all of a sudden you get another shot at it yeah. some seven years later. Well, there's a, a complex dance between the sun and the moon and the earth, and when, I you, want when you work out all the details, this is something that you get. Yeah. You have to remember that most of the earth is not inhabited or ocean, so eclipses are happening constantly, but nobody's seeing them but penguins and fish. Yeah. And so uh, the ones where hit where people live, those are the ones that really get excited about. They get all the luck. A few other things that are going on in the skies for the rest of the year that I'm sure that some, a lot of people are excited about for 2017. Venus and Jupiter are closest than they've been in a long time on November 13th. Why is that significant, or is that just more of a star? stargazer thing? Uh, well, when you go outside and take a look at the planets, uh, the planets can be anywhere in the sky, but sometimes they line up. So yeah. the way the sun and the moon lines up and you get what's called a conjunction. And that looks pretty cool. And also things that people have thought throughout history are sort of significant. Um, so the one that's coming up um, in November is going to be only visible uh, very early in the morning, pretty close to the sun. That might be a hard one for a lot of people to see. Uh, but planetary conjunctions are usually good things to go outside and take a look at with your eyes. And once again, that's more of an event because, I mean, people have always been worried that when planets line up mm -hmm. in a certain way that somehow it's going to have this impact or, or, or something's going to that's happen. Right. Very seldom, nothing happens. Well, we don't have to worry about the end of the world or Armageddon anymore. We can just go out and take a look at it and have, and have a good time nowadays. We like the uh, meteor showers as well and the... Uh, Geminide? Geminid? Geminid. Geminid. Thank you. <laughs> Meteor shower, December 13th. And what's great about that one is you're going to have a crescent moon. you got a better chance of seeing it. So that's kind of cool as well. Right. So a meteor shower is when the Earth goes through a stream of debris from a comet. When those little particles hit our atmosphere, they light up and make these uh, meteor lights in the sky. Um, so they're events that occur every year. Now, sometimes when they occur, there's a big, bright, full moon out, and things are yeah, kind of bright, bright and hard to see. So we like to find the ones when the moon is in its phases where it's not too bright. Uh, so for that one in December, um, if we get someplace dark, it's good to get outside the city, uh, take a look to the east towards mm -hmm. the constellation of Gemini, the twins, and you'll see these little streaks of light across the sky. For a, a good one, you can get one or two of them every minute. Um, they require that some patience cool. to look yeah. at. You have to kind of relax and, and, and set back and, uh, and let your eyes adjust, and the meteor uh, showers are good events. Bundle up, though, if you're going to check out the ones that are in December. December so, 13th, yeah. exactly. So the only thing that's going to ruin this would be those weather guys and clouds, right? So this Monday should be fantastic. That's right, yeah. So, so hopefully we'll get some good weather. We'll get some nice, uh, clear skies. Uh, one of the things about being an astronomer is there's nothing you can do. If it's, if it's cloudy, yeah. that's just the way it is. So and we'll have to hope for good weather. There's others you can blame as well, right? Okay, there we'll blame some. Somebody, yeah. So do it safely. Make sure you got exactly. glasses. The, the, the little uh, uh, hole works really yeah. well. Or, or visit uh, one of the great places that are going to be having these uh, uh, public events uh, yes. for kids and people of all ages. Dr. Lee Carter, yeah. thank you so much from the uh, John Deere Planetarium. Thanks have for fun. Me I will. Ha well, yeah, like I have to tell you that. You're going to have fun. In a moment, making sure good environmental science gets funded in the cities. But first, Laura Adams joins us with some of the events that should be on your list of things to do when you go out and about. This is Out and About for August 14th through 20th. Hi, I'm Laura Adams. 
paddle from one of five launch sites to Lake Potter in Rock Island during Floatzilla, August 19th. Or check out the New Windsor Fair Rodeo and Horse Show August 17th through the 19th in New Windsor. And Friendly House is holding a trivia night at the Knights of Columbus in Davenport August 18th. Reserve your table now. Gather your team or supporters for a walk to defeat ALS taking place at Modern Woodman Park August 19th. The Antique Automobile Club of the Mississippi Valley hosts 250 antique cars at the Isle Casino Hotel and Quad Cities Waterfront Convention Center August 17th through 19th. And the German American Heritage Center hosts a Zither concert on August 20th by the Davenport Zither Ensemble. The Orion Community Band present an outdoor concert in Central Park August 16th, while the Quad City Symphony presents their Riverfront Pops concert featuring a tribute to the Beatles in the Clare Park August 19th. Circa 21 presents the raucous musical Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, and each Thursday in August, a special performance of No Business Like Show Business. The rock musical Rock of Ages continues through the 19th at the Black Box Theater in Moline, and the establishment presents true stories from the comedians' lives that become ammunition for new, hilarious, improvised scenes on August 18th. The Call Ballroom presents a big band weekend August 18th through 20th. For more information, visit WQPT.org. Thank you, Laura. Musician Mike Cochran is a familiar face at the River Music Experience. He often performs on the community stage, and that's where we caught up with him. As he played, it won't last long. It won't last long. Mike Cochran at the community stage of the River Music Experience. Mark Schwiebert has left his mark on Rock Island, a successful lawyer, longtime mayor. His name is now most widely known for the park named after him on the Rock Island Riverfront, but he still has much to do. He says the changing climate, the serious extremes of weather we've seen, is creating terrific hardship and human suffering. And now he's decided to put his money where his mouth is, awarding the first grants from the Mark W. Schwiebert Fund for Environmental Studies, administered by the Community Foundation of the Great River Band. And joining us is the President, Sherry Rista, of CEO of the uh, Community Foundation of the Great River Band, and Mark Schwiebert as well. Thank you both for joining us. Good to be here. So that's exactly what it is. You're putting your money where your mouth is. Yeah. Well, that's right. I mean, that's, I think, the intention of setting up the fund. This is a, uh, a, a truly important concern the human race is facing, probably the most important concern that affects our survival as a species on the planet. And it's really not getting the attention that it's due. So I've tried to lend what modest support I can to trying to uh, underscore this as a concern and, and help with both education and research projects that might move us in the right direction. Well, obviously the question I have to ask is that with uh, uh, climate change being such a critical issue for you, 
Is it even more frustrating when you hear that people that are denying it and saying that it's just bad science and that it's all propaganda? Yeah, and I have to say that's disgraceful. It really is disgraceful. Because what we're doing is we're basically uh, rejecting science, rejecting the clear consensus of what scientists across the globe have identified as a problem in return for short-term profits. We're betraying the future of our children and our children's children for short-term profits. And there's no other word for it to me than disgraceful. Well, and Sherry, the Community Foundation wanted to get part of this. Why? Why did you want to be instrumental in, in granting these grants? Well, it's not so much about granting the grants as much as it is uh, being a source, being a vehicle for um, our donors like Mark mm -hmm. who want to make an impact on things that they're very passionate about. So the Community Foundation is the vehicle uh, that helps people like Mark make a difference and really uh, do something with their passions and invest back in their own community sure. and things that are very important to them um, for our future. What do you think of something like this? You know, a, a leading citizen who, who's more known for the, mm -hmm. the uh, public side actually taking a, a stand on an issue, a volatile issue, and actually making sure that uh, something is done locally about it. I think it's great. Um, I think it's great that Mark can use the, through the Community Foundation, make grants. Um, and in this case, it's for research and education um, to help our young people, to help uh, people in our community understand something that he is very passionate about um, and why, and help us all get a better understanding on a very important topic like this. Well, and Mark, you developed these grants to nonprofits, schools, and government. I was a little surprised by the government part, because you think government can fund itself. Well, I think that the issue has to do with a couple of things. First of all, in order for a grants to be given through the Community Foundation, it has to be to a 501c3 organization, mm -hmm. a not-for-profit organization. And that kind of limits the, uh, the recipients that you can have. But given this, uh, the times in which we live, government is oftentimes in as need of funding for these kinds of things as other organizations would be. Government should be putting money into it, and many governments are across America and around the globe. Governments are spending great deals of money on exploring alternatives for how to be more responsible in conserving our environment and shifting from consumption to a more conservation-based model of doing things. But this is one added source, a small source to be sure, but hopefully a strategically useful source that can assist with some of the local units of government. For example, this year, Bi-State Regional Commission, right. which is a great collaborative between the two sides of the river working for programs, was one of the recipients of one of the grants. And they're using it for uh, purposes of e uh, evaluating energy efficiency and, and OSHA compliance and other things that have to do with the environment. And so I think it's a, it, we want it to be as broad and flexible as possible. And the other two grants happen to go to Augustana College and to the Eastern Iowa Community College, uh, both of which are using it for either internships or for study programs that will be useful in, again, improving awareness of the environment and how we can better manage our uh, responsible use of it. Augustana is to fund urban watersheds projects. I mean, that's kind of an interesting area that you don't necessarily think of linking to climate change. Well, it has to do, I think, with the, the health of uh, uh, our watersheds, and particularly in the city of Rock Island as it relates to urban forests. And of course, urban forests and forests in general are a critical link in the whole ecosystem. One of the fascinating things about nature, if you look at it, and I'm a lawyer, so this isn't something I do as a career, but if you start looking at it and studying it, is that nature is this remarkable balance. The, the planet Earth has created this incredibly harmonious system that's self-perpetuating over time. Plants ingest carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. Animals, including the human species, ingest oxygen and produce carbon dioxide. The forests are one of the methods that we have of absorbing that carbon dioxide that we're producing at an unacceptably high rate and converting it back to oxygen again. So it really does tie in with that whole matrix of, 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 of uh, the natural balance of which we as humans are a part. Well, and Sherry, how does a group get involved in this? How, how do you get into the grant application process to say, look, we're really interested in this well, we are working in this area, we would like to see some, some grant money to further well, our, our I project. think that can happen in a number of ways. It can happen very proactively and very responsibly. And um, we can seek out applications, send out an RFP. Mm -hmm. um, we can work with the donor to identify organizations and agencies that they might mm -hmm. be interested in helping, that they're aware of, that are doing this work. So 
can happen in a number of different ways. And where do you see this growing? I mean, the, you, you're giving out your mm -hmm. first three grants, but you actually started your foundation in 2015. Right. You, you've got the money now that you were able to make the first three grants. When will be the next couple? I don't, I don't want to push you ahead. No. But I mean, do you plan on making this an annual event oh, or, right. or no, or no right. real timeline? Yeah, no, the in intention is to, uh, to do annual gifts. The applications will be received uh, through the Community Foundation every spring. We'll announce the grant recipients in June of each year. Uh, and that'll be it for the year, and then we'll start over again the following spring. My own plans are to continue to increase the fund uh, by making annual gifts to the fund. And of course, uh, if individuals in the community wanted to contribute to it, I'm sure they could as well. Um, I haven't been banking on that, but uh, the intention is to continue to systematically grow the fund and to um, uh, do these annual gifts, uh, hopefully in perpetuity. What do you hope to accomplish? Well, the two major purposes for the fund are educational and research. So one of the purposes would be, for example, to host speakers who might be talking about subjects of the environment or possibly a lectureship at one of the colleges that would focus on environmental concerns. Um, uh, to, to make the public more aware of the seriousness of this problem and some of the alternatives that we have to simply continuing on a, on a dangerous course uh, by moving in a new and constructive direction. The second purpose is for research and the purpose for that is basically to identify products or processes that can be useful and, and possibly even profitable uh, for those who produce them uh, that uh, can move us in the direction of being more environmentally responsible and bringing us more nearly in line with where we need to be if we want to sustain life on this planet. I, I recently finished a biography of Elon Musk I thought was quite fascinating and he's talking about trying to populate the planet Mars. Now the planet Mars is uninhabited and there's a reason for that. It's uninhabitable. <laughs> the Earth is and it's the only planet that we are aware of in all of our knowledge of, this, of the heavens as we were just talking about this, the solar eclipse, the only planet we're aware of that can support life like we can here on Earth. And it occurs to me that it's imperative for us to maintain this as a place where life can be sustained so that we don't have to offsource it to another location because we've destroyed this wonderful environment that we're a part of. I think conservatives and liberals should be a part of this. Actually, the word conserve or conservation mm -hmm. derives from the world con word conservative. They come from the same source. We're all in this together. And as, as the astronauts who first walked on the moon told us many years ago, ours is a spaceship Earth. And it's important for us to make sure we conserve the resources on which we depend so that future generations will be able to thrive as we have. And I would assume also, because when you're talking about education, you want to reach new minds and open minds. You don't just want to preach to the choir. Oh, exactly. I mean, that's, that's one of the, the issues that we have now. I, I think that most people get it. They understand this is real. Certainly around the world we do, in this country, uh, the, 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 the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of scientists embrace this concept. We're moving in the right direction in many respects. It's regrettable that our national leadership has decided to be like the folks in Columbus time who said the earth is flat. Um, but that, the trains left the station in many respects. Most people understand this is a real problem when we need to deal with it, and our young people in particular, I think, are aware of that, and that gives me hope. What do you think of Mark starting this? You know, um, in philanthropy, there's a, there are a lot of key leaders across the nation, across the world in philanthropy that have identified um, environment and climate change as really, really key priorities. And so, the opportunity for us as a community foundation to work with Mark and I, I think as Mark does this, more and more people, potential donors and people will come forward to support this kind of work for both the environment and climate change. But at, at the end of the day, it's, about our, it's also about our community. What are we doing as a community, right. as community leaders like Mark and donors and others? And so bringing people together to think about the impact that we can have. What, what difference can we make today you know, for the future? I just, again, I'm repeating myself about that, but that's, that's a huge part about what the Community Foundation is, is about. And just it's to a, piggyback on that, Sherry, I think that that's a useful point to make is that this fund is really going to be allocated primarily for initiatives here within the Quad Cities mm -hmm. community, the bi-state region that we're a part of. Yeah. It's not really intended to fund things on the East Coast, the West Coast, or some other part of the United States. Great. It's intended to fund things here in our community. Mark Schwieber, Sherry Ristoff, thank you thank so much you. for joining us. We appreciate thank it. You. We very much do.
WQPT is doing its part to support the military men and women in the cities who are serving our nation. We call it embracing the military. And next Thursday is another chance for people to get better, to, uh, get to better know, I should say, Arsenal Island and the cities that surround it. A newcomer's tour and orientation and bus tour is scheduled all day, August 24th. Includes free breakfast and lunch and offers something for everyone in our area and what they need to know about this region. Just contact the Army MWR office to make reservations on the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device. Thanks for taking some time to join us. We talk about the issues on the cities. Public affairs programming on WQPT is brought to you by the Singh Group at Merrill Lynch. Serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years.